Welcome to the documentary from the BBC World Service, where we report the world, however difficult the issue, however hard to reach. Podcasts from the BBC World Service are supported by advertising. One farm in particular used to put people in, in oil drums, and after they've been dumped in oil drums, beat them up with a sambok, which are plastic. A, a thing, whip, basically. A whip, basically. Nico Janssen, farm manager. The oldest house on the farm uh, dates from before 1690. In the 1680s census, there were already two settlers here, two European hunters, hunting in our river for hippopotami and elephants, <laughs> of which, of course, there are none left. Mark Soames, farm owner. I told him I don't trust white people at all. So, you know, this, in this room, what you have to remember is that this house was built by slaves. This is the ship that brought my ancestors here. Mark is a sixth-generation South African who began investing in this farm 17 years ago. There was this ship, the Arab, which I knew my ancestors had come on the Arab. I thought the Arab is, is in, it sank in Table Bay. Nico comes from a long line of farm and domestic labourers in the Cape Winelands. People have to work from sunrise to sunset. And how, if you are a, a wife and a woman... How would you feel if your family could only start eating 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock in the evening because you have to still prepare food for them? So it's under, underneath the city of Cape Town is, is the ship that brought my ancestors here. Mm. This valley, which is now called Franschhoek, French Quarter, was called Ulifanshoek, Elephant's Quarter. It's so sad. I mean, everything about South Africa is just excruciatingly painful. In layers upon layers. Everybody I meet on this farm calls Mark Prof or the Professor. Nico sold nursery plants on the farm before Mark took it over. Our first winemaker was, he was German, but he was a boor, like in the African sense, a boor. So one of the things he said to the professor was, listen, I'm, I don't like the idea that Nico's people doesn't work even on weekends and stop working so early. And then when professor talked to me about it, I said to him, listen, that's exactly what I want to stop. I want to stop the slavery system. It's an historic farm. It was established as a farm in 1690. So it dates the occupation by colonists. It was one of those places where the trouble began. The taking of the land is actually the essence of what colonization is about. And remarkably, all these years later and all these years after the end of apartheid, the land is still pretty much in the same hands. I'm Audrey Brown reporting for the BBC World Service... And it is beautiful here, on this farm, with its tragic layers. Nico takes me for a stroll on a late summer afternoon after the harvest. OK, what what happens is there, are there things, snakes? Yeah, there are snakes and uh, two familiar snakes, which are most of the most serious uh, snakes. We've got the Cape Cobra and the Puff Adder. Seriously, yeah? Seriously, I on the farm. Wow. Yeah, and the... Yes, have you have you found have you found them yeah, on this lots, farm lots, already? Lots, have lots. people been bitten? Hundreds, not no, no. Our people are very clever. Okay, they check uh, it out. Avoid being bitten, but okay. it could happen any time. Okay, and well, so I better far... be one of your clever people and eh? not get bitten. <laughs> okay, all right, let's stand here. Yeah. I said now, I'm, I must just explain to BBC World Service listeners. I'm standing in the middle of a vineyard, surrounded by mountains. The mountains that picturesque mountains. Picturesque mountains. <laughs> <laughs> one of them is called the Lady on Her Back. The other one is called Devil's Tooth, and the other one is called Breasts. And if you saw them, you'll see exactly what people mean when they call them those, because it's so obvious. <laughs> <laughs> There's laughter here, but bitter inequality. The essence of the problem, obviously, is the ownership of the land. How can you infuse your serfs in the project to transform your farm? The problem is I own the land. I own the land because my forebears stole it. And uh, the farm workers who live there, who are my responsibility, my patriarchal responsibility, are there because their land was stolen from them or because they were yanked there from foreign parts as slaves and uh, they were just deposited there by history. So on my land, I own it because of that history. They own nothing because of that history. How are you going to fix it? Well, you know, you've got to give the land back. So far, so obvious. Just give back the land. But can Mark bring himself to do it? After all, 
I said to myself things like, well, it wasn't me who took the land. Who do I give it to? Some symbolic bushman? Or do we divide it up so that each family gets a little piece? And then I told myself, what about food security? If we do that, forgetting, of course, that it's a wine farm. What I was doing was making excuses, not least of them and the most practical of them was, well, their farm workers don't know how to run a farm. If I was to give the farm to them, it would end in tears, you know. But those are excuses. I really mean it when I say that morally there's no question about it, but that the land should be given back. And I finally came to the realization, and I'm not proud uh, to say this to you at all, but it is the truth. I came to the realization I don't want to. You know, I'm, for, my, for reasons of my own self-interest, despite knowing the history, despite facing all of those historical facts, there were three crimes against humanity. You know, the stealing of the land, slavery and apartheid, all committed on my farm. And knowing all of that, I wasn't able to do the right thing. If morals were the only consideration, that is the right thing to do. You know, if you have stolen goods, you, you can't keep them. And if you really want to rectify what's wrong in South Africa still today, I mean, and let me make it plain, what's wrong still today is that the perpetrators of apartheid have kept the spoils. No, he can't do it. But he does decide to be a good farmer, better than so many who've come before him. For, for 1994. So what was it like to live and work on a farm before 1994? Then the farmers were very bossy and controlling. You just had to do what you were told. If you made one wrong move, they chased you away quickly. And then you had to find other work. They're not as rude and high-handed as they used to be. When we first came here, farmers on all these farms used to force people to do work in the rain. They gave you a skimpy raincoat to work in, and you'd work all day cleaning drains and furrows. Kurs, a retired worker on the farm. Was it like that everywhere? All the farms around here used to be like that. But now it's not like that anymore. They used to make you work in the rain. You couldn't stop and go home when it started raining. Prof changed a lot of things. He did a lot about our housing. He did things that the other farmers didn't do. He put in DSTV. Now you might think that cable TV is no big deal. But it's the way an entire generation of farm workers' children on this farm learned to speak English. Yet still Mark, the good farmer, and his workers remain worlds apart. No escaping the past. And incidentally, I don't know if you've noticed, no white South African seems to have supported apartheid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is a very yeah. famous joke in South Africa that there's no white person seems to have. Did you vote for apartheid? No, as it happens, I didn't. But I know it carries no special meaning because everyone says that. But you knew people who did? Yes, and I think, to be honest, my own mother did. I remember her crying when Favut was assassinated. We were not a particularly progressive family. But he continues to try and make progressive changes. I met with them and wanted to make plans with them as to how we can transform this farm. And it was quite impossible to have a, any kind of um, uh, conversation with them. I gave him just a piece of my mind. I said, who the hell do you think, Mark Solms, you're coming from abroad? There was no, no precedent that you discuss with the landowner what's going to happen. They don't, they're, I'm sure they didn't trust me. You know, all, all, all sorts of things um, were factored into the impossibility of us planning together. I'm indigenous to this farm and I'm indigenous to this land. And who do you think you people coming and you just buy up farms and kick people off? I'm sick and tired of it. So I started making a few reforms on my own bat as I had to, changing employment conditions and housing conditions and so on. And when the workers started to see that I really meant it, that I'm not like my predecessors, to my absolute horror, the conclusion they seemed to have come to was I'm a fool. And he asked me if I wanted to come back and work for him. And I said, no, are you crazy? I'm not going to work for any white man anymore. And so within a few months, we were in the most terrible situation where people were not turning up for work, taking advantage, as I ex- experienced it, of my, of my goodness, you know, and feeling, you know, these people are not grateful. And so in a, in a few months, I'd become my own worst nightmare. I was speaking like a white South African farmer and I was at loggerheads with my workers. And things didn't look that well for the business. One of the ladies of the staff, of the kitchen staff, came to me and she asked me, Nico, are you sure we're going to make it? Somewhere along the line in this mess of difficult relationships and alienation, everything had to stop. Something new had to be done. Mark had to bring another part of himself to bear on this schism, the part of him that is a trained and practicing psychoanalyst. 
the farm stopped work. If there's any one reason that I had to identify as to why I am more willing to face the unwelcome truth about what it means to be a white South African of my generation, it's probably that, that I was psychoanalyzed and learned how to look things in the eye. And, you know, these are things which are self-evidently true, uh, as, uh, that we benefited. And There that's... must be another reason. I know psychoanalysts in South Africa, and they still slightly recalcitrant. You know, they do acknowledge, yes, it happened and even the way they talk about it, it happened, not it was done. I read somewhere that on your farm is a an ancient site, archaeological site. What I did after realising what a mess we were really in was to do what one does clinically, which is take a history. You know, when a patient presents with a complaint, uh, with a symptom, you, 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 your first port of call in terms of trying to understand what needs doing is to take a history so you understand how it all began. That's how you arrive at a diagnosis. So I, I thought, let's do this. Let's take a history of my farm. And uh, so I brought in professional help in the form of archaeologists and historians, and we stopped farming. The farm workers and I collectively assisted the archaeologists in digging up the history of the farm in order to understand how did we come to this pass. And one of the most momentous things that happened in that process was the discovery of a Bushman settlement site, 6,000 years old, about 50 yards from my front door. So that sort of puts things into perspective to see the physical evidence. And when I say physical evidence, I don't mean the odd shard or something. I mean, there were just thousands upon thousands of stone, beautiful microlithic stone tools and uh, pottery shards and whatnot in this one spot. What more evidence do you need than uh, that to demonstrate that this land was somebody else's? And it, it was made all the more dramatic, uh, the finding of that settlement site, by dint of the fact that among the farm workers are the descendants of those dispossessed Bushmen and Khoi Khoi, whose land this was. So it was an enormous eye-opener for us all. Those excavations pulled everyone together. I needed to do something. I could tell Professor, listen... You said you want to listen to me and help you understand the people. Then you have to take advice from me how I want to change things, you know. So one of the first things was housing. I just said to him, listen, the housing condition that we're living in, our doors look like horse sheds. I want to change that. We have outside loose. I want to change that. We don't have proper electricity. I want to change that. And he listened. And that was... Why I still am here today, 17 years later, because I could see he's not like a normal, the, the white type of people that I used to know. Facing the facts helps because it removes scales from, well, it removes blinkers from your eyes. You know, you then say, OK, now here's another fact. I'm not as good as I think I am, but I owe an enormous debt. What am I going to do about it? How am I going to look myself in the mirror in the morning uh, living in this great big farmhouse? You know, knowing that it was built by slaves, for example, and that their descendants still work for me and have nothing. Welcome to most of the Cape winemaking region of South Africa, the confluence of the lucrative tourism, wine and food industries. But this farm did something revolutionary for an area where hardly an acre of land has been given back in restitution. So the solution we came to is that I mortgaged my farm so that the farm workers could take out a bank loan so that they could buy the farm next door to me. And I did that together with a neighbor, a very decent and long-standing friend of mine, in fact, from England, named Richard Astor. We mortgaged both of our farms. And you can get roughly 50% of the value of your farm from a bank. And so 50 plus 50 makes 100. So we then had sufficient funds borrowed from a bank in order for the farm workers to be able to buy a farm every bit as big as and beautiful and historic as Richard and mine. And then we faced the question, we're at risk if that farm doesn't succeed. And so we formed a partnership with the farm workers. So that's the model that we pioneered, if I can use that word, that we don't give up our land, but we, recognizing our debt, use it as a lever for enabling the landless people on our land to become landowners themselves. Those beautiful shards are now in glass cases in a museum on the farm and the names and the stories of those who came before Mark and Nico recorded on the walls. Part of the story Mark tells me is that of the very first white settlers who came as workers for the Dutch East India Company. 
The first settlers were very simple people. They were not educated, they were illiterate, they were from the lowest rungs of European society. This was their great opportunity. You know, they, well, first of all, they worked for the company in horrid jobs, soldiers and sailors, but then when they were freed from their contracts because the company realized they needed farmers, this was like, like Hans Silberbach was a peasant from Germany, Jewish peasant from Germany. There's no way he could own land. No, never in the in the 17th century, a peasant, let alone a Jew, you know, never ever would own land. So he suddenly is given this piece of land. It's like whew. the taking of these farms was a catastrophe for the local people. But put yourself in Hans Zilberbach's shoes and ask, what would you do? You know, would you have said no? It's not right. This is a drawing from 1710. The we don't. This is our valley, but we don't know whether any one of these houses is ours. We don't know. We can't identify them. And there came music. When we did all of this research, the farm workers spontaneously became interested in their musical heritage. And, and without us designing it, we just had an explosion of music. When we discovered that there had been slaves on our farm since the 1690s to the 1830s, we also discovered that they always made music. Susanna Malchas runs a shop on the farm and is the chair lady of Die Sutstemme, the Sweet Voices, one of the choirs here. And after the emancipation of the slaves, they made a particular kind of music. So we decided we are going to make music as well. We formed a band and we write songs that talk about our history. This is a very traditional song that's being sung here. And everybody's really enjoying themselves, starting to dance as well as the song is being played. This is Klopse music, made with homemade instruments, and it goes back to the days when slaves had one guaranteed holiday, the 2nd of January. We now farm wine and music here. We have a huge musical uh, project with real musicians. I mean, they get gigs and they have CDs and they win prizes and they earn a living from music. There's another kind of museum in the neighbouring town of Franschuk, which tells a narrower story of South Africa. Many Huguenots fled to neighbouring countries. In 1652, Jan van Riebeek established a refreshment station at the Cape of Good Hope for the Dutch East India Company. When they were talking about the establishment of the farms here, not a single mention of the people that were found here, not a single mention of the people that were brought in and enslaved to build those vineyards and to build those farmlands, and not a single mention of the fact that the land was stolen from those people. It's a fascinating exercise in erasing the history of the original people of South Africa. And I must say, I'm surprised to find that this museum exists in this form still in South Africa, in modern South Africa, in the 21st century of South Africa, 23 years after the dawn of democracy in this country. I can tell you that the only representation of a black person or a brown person or a person, an indigenous person of South Africa in that entire presentation was an image of an indigenous person hunched down on his, on his knees looking up at white people. Why you? Why are you dissident? Psychoanalysis, for all of the complexities that it appears to embody, really is a very simple business. It's, it's, a, it's about facing the facts, facing up to unwelcome truths on the basis of the belief that our troubles come from us avoiding things, from things that we can't cope with emotionally, we avoid them, but they're there nevertheless. So, you know, you can avoid reality, but it doesn't go away. Part of that reality is that many people still won't accept this new ownership vision. Nico's co-workers, for instance, frankly just don't trust him. You could see that people were trying to move away from me. You know, people exclude me because they were scared that I might, besides the good that it could bring, also it could also be that I could tell the personal things over to professor, you know. And, and so they, they felt that you were, could be like a spy, so they could, isolated you. Exactly, and that I felt for a very long time. Again, things begin to fail. The money is bleeding away. They need more investment. Mark goes to other farmers in the area for support. They're not all against him by any means. Many are helping their workers in other ways, but they're sceptical about even sharing their land. 
the richest people in the country live around here. And some of them are progressive and enlightened people. But, you know, this is the problem that we face in this country, that when it comes to the crunch, where you say, okay, what are you willing to give up? Or what are you willing to even just risk? But we couldn't get anyone to to do it. You know, in the end, when it came to that final hurdle, nobody wanted to invest. Rich people are rich for a reason. You know, (laughs) if it's a question of, you know, do I invest this in this safe bet and this high return thing or do I invest this in this risky bet with low returns but morally it's the right thing to do they do the former they don't do the latter Jacques Trudeau is part owner of a neighboring farm he and his partners operate a workers charity funded by the profits of their farm he thinks Mark's model is unsustainable I believe what I'm doing is a better model than just handing over property Uh, that's the bottom line and I, uh, handing over property is not going to help anybody. It's also quite difficult to do, isn't it? It's exactly. It is, but it's not going to help anybody. Even I, with my, I'm responsible to my partners who put up most of the money. I put up a very small amount because I'm not an extraordinarily wealthy guy. And it's an extraordinary big farm, uh, Crossroad. It requires a lot of people to help. Even that model, where I'm not handing over ownership, but I'm handing over profit, is worrying me every day. I have sleepless nights if it's going to work. Why? Because if it fails, I have failed the people that put up the money and I failed the community. So I take that responsibility very seriously. That's why. It's not easy. And Jacques is right. The model didn't work. The farm is going under. But in an unbelievable twist in our story, the South African government steps in and saves the day. It buys a 50% stake in the farm under what is called the 50-50 policy. It gives the workers collective ownership of half of the land and the business. And in the middle of this harvest celebration on the lawns here, surrounded by mature trees and historic buildings, Mark and Nico, standing on the massive festival stage, share their wonderful news. Just one last thing I must tell you. Remember, farm workers on Somme's Delta always used to own a third of the farm. But this year, the government has stepped in and up their share, and it's now come up to 50-50. And, uh, oh, oh, here's my co-owner, Nico Janssen. He's been the farm manager for all these years, and, and he's been that since 2001. Maybe he can say a few words before we hand back to Yapi Khos to start proceedings. Nico Janssen. Hello Professor, and hello, Amal, hello, Professor and hello everyone. It's a big privilege for me to see you all here. It's a pleasure for us, our workers here, to thank you all for what you've done for the language Afrikaans. I want to talk about the word coincidence. If it exists, it means God didn't have a plan, but he did. Because look at us today. Professor, I just want to tell you not to worry. Remember when everybody laughed at a joke someone made about blacks being top dogs and the whites at the bottom? You all laughed at the joke. But now it's a fact. That day has come. We're in charge. I just want to say thank you once again to everybody here for this privilege. Mark and Nico hug and throw their hands up victorious before handing the mic back to the MC. And the party begins. My visit to Solms Delta Farm for the BBC has unearthed a unique story in the Cape Winelands. But this is not a happy ending. Because the story hasn't ended yet. I think it's, I have such an ambiguous position because they simultaneously see me as a troublemaker. And as a fig leaf. 
Whenever there's trouble, like recently there was a television program in Norway and the shop, the wine stores started removing South African wine from their shelves in the wake of this program. It was about the conditions under which farm workers live on the farms producing these wines. So I was then asked by the industry you know, to make a statement because they said it's not really fair, they've just found a few bad eggs. They wanted to sort of trot me out as an example of you know, what the industry's really like. And what did you do? No, I didn't do it because I'm not what the industry's really like. But I also don't want to harm the South African wine industry. You know, a lot of people's jobs depend on it. But I think that it's a very competitive in international industry and if our competitors can use our lack of ethical standards as a basis for removing us from the competition, I think that they're missing a trick if they don't do that. Nico! Huh? And I see it coming. I thought you were going to say white people are going to be slaughtered in their beds, you know, there will be blood on the walls. The young Christian Smuts, who was the Prime Minister of South Africa and who has a lot to answer for, because he was a nasty piece of work, as, alongside being relatively enlightened, he was once asked to define the character of South Africa. And uh, he said, and I think it's the best definition I've ever heard, he said, the worst never happens. He elaborated and said something like, South Africa will never be as great as it could be, but it will never culminate in the catastrophe that it could. And I think there is something about the South African setup where we kind of muddle through, you know, we, we, we withdraw from the brink. There's another Afrikaans saying, a boer mark a plan, which translated loosely is, you know, farmers are pragmatic people. And I think that it applies not only to farmers, but at bottom, South Africans are pragmatic people. There are dozens of different podcasts now available from the BBC, including news, documentaries, science, business, arts and sport. For details of them all, go to bbcworldservice.com slash podcasts.